Hello. Good morning. Um, I've got to say, following someone who was really honing in on my fear of public speaking was not really how I wanted to do this, but... <laughs> All right. One more. All right. Well, today what I want to talk about is essentially what makes us who we are. Why are we different than other animals? Are we? And how did we get this way? Now, um, for the last couple decades, uh, a couple of folks, in particular a guy named Richard Wrangham from Harvard, have been proposing that what really makes us who we are is that we eat cooked food, which sounds a little quick and trite, but he has now written a book and a great many papers and worked with grad students, and he's got a really strong body of evidence that what makes us different than other apes and many of our ancestors is that we had access to cooked food and all the extra calories that makes available, and it freed up energy for our great big brains, which are a great big part of many of the other things people would point out without our languages and our cultures and many things that make us special. And he argues that it's that cooked food that was the link that let this all get going. Now, we have a lot of physical adaptations, that he would argue, that are linked to having access to cooked food and fire. We're not just like the rest of the apes on the planet now. We're not just like a lot of the ones that have come before us in the last five, six million years. Particularly, we have very small teeth, very small jaw muscles. We can't chew all day. Most other apes do. Gorillas, chimpanzees chew for hours, 12, 14 hours a day. We can't do that. If we have to live on raw food, we lose weight. It's a great diet. In fact, if you go on the raw food diet, um, you'd be in trouble, probably, without access to airplanes to move food around, without oil presses, without an almond industry in California. It's rough. In fact, uh, the raw food diet uh, does have side effects for some women. It actually re um, eliminates reproduction, which is not a great evolutionary adaptation. So Rangham may be on to something in this argument about the raw food. He talks about other adaptations besides just our teeth and jaws and our brain size, uh, and some people talk about adaptations such as our tool use and our bipedalism. And over the last four, five, six million years, there are quite a few folks back there in our family tree. There are arguably a dozen or two dozen different hominin species coming through to finally end up in us. And these species tend to be smaller, have much smaller skulls, much smaller brains. And for example, over here on the, on the side, Sagittal crests, what makes a gorilla look kind of like the mohawk thing is going on there, is a big bone across the top of their skull, and that's where the big jaw muscles attach that let them chew for 12 or 14 hours a day. We don't have that crest. That's why we don't look like Klingons, right? So <laughs> we don't have the jaw muscles that are going to let us do that kind of all-day work. Now, this all seemed to have changed pretty quickly. I mean, there's a lot of adaptations happening to Lucy and different species before us, but somewhere around two million years ago, Things really changed. Australopithecus gets loose in Bellingham, runs in here. That creates a bit of an emergency. We have an animal in the room. You know, there's, no, there's no fake in it for him. He's coming in, bloop, 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 and you're like, oh, the thing. <laughs> Somewhere around two million years ago, Homo erectus shows up in Africa. Homo erectus shows up here, perhaps with a nudity issue, but you would be thinking, dude, get some clothes on, or something along those lines more or less recognizable as us. In a short period of time, a couple hundred thousand years, brain size has essentially doubled from the size of a fist to two fists. Wrangham and others argue that's because of all of the extra calories available from cooked food. The brain is a hugely energy-hungry thing. It needs a lot of energy. Now, the way we have traditionally viewed our evolutionary processes here are that all these different adaptations have been taking place through millions of years. Bipedalism, useful for moving fuels around, small teeth for quite some time, unable to do some of the chewing the other apes do. The arrival of tools, the arrival of our big brains, all this stuff is taking place. And until fairly recently, we thought all this happened, and then somewhere around a half million years ago, thank goodness we started having fire. So in that last time period there, what you have to believe is that there were big-brained animals with jaws that couldn't chew the food all day, somehow getting by without airplanes and oil presses and almond orchards. Now, Rangham would argue, there's plenty of evidence that fire was going back at least two million years. It's our bodies. 
It's the teeth. It's the jaw muscles. It's the short intestines. It's the way we need cooked food. Now, in the last couple years, literally, we've been seeing more and more evidence of fire further and further back in the record, getting closer, interestingly, to that two million year point. We've seen evidence now in South Africa of fire probably being used by ancestors, perhaps, up to like 1.7 million years. So we're starting to see this idea that perhaps we were living in the presence of fire for a much longer time than we thought. Now, this still raises some interesting chicken and egg puzzles. Now, for example, bipedalism evolved quite some time ago. Now, I've got to say, it's a very useful feature for moving fuels around. If you want to make a fire, standing on two feet is a great thing, moving fuels around. But just moving fuels, if I move a big wet branch like that and set it on a fire, it's going to just go out. Right? You need intellectual capability to understand dry fuels. And moving fuels around is tricky for anything bigger than a stick. You need tools to break up fuels. You need something that'll break up wood into smaller pieces. I've spent a lot of time in the Forest Service fighting fires, and we spent a lot of nights on fires trying to stay warm. And I'll tell you, nothing comes in as handy as a chainsaw to make a bunch of big fires to sleep around when it's raining at night. And it rains on fires, I promise you that. Interestingly enough, we, our ancestors, have had stone tools for around 1.7, maybe more million years. And one of the interesting features of these tools is they're really big. Here's the size of it. I have a big hand pointed out again to me today. It's just somewhat of a mystery. People argue about what the heck did our ancestors use axes for? Since there wasn't fire until a half million years ago, they must have been really doing a not job on those mammoths or something. Um, I would argue that even just the name, we call them axes. We, we look at that and we know what the tool is. Now, all of these things require mental capabilities. Making a fire. Hands up, who has ever made a fire just with sticks? They found in the woods without matches, without a bow. I'm waiting for the hands down because you used the bow. All right. <laughs> Out of a thousand people, I got, I got about seven. It's very tricky. I am not in that club. This is a failed attempt, by the way. <laughs> lots of trying on a hearth with dry kindling, lots of videos, lots of lessons, <laughs> dried tinder. This is technology. You know, many different people have arguments one way or another, but this is the technology. All of the rest are impossible without fire. Go make, a, uh, go make a chip for your computer without making something hot, I dare you. Um, and it's hard to do. It's a technology, it requires thinking, it requires language, it requires communication, it requires culture over probably centuries of sharing this information until whole groups of our ancestors were able to make fire. So here's the chicken and egg problem. If eating cooked food is what allowed our brains to double in size. If eating cooked food and having access to extra energy and heat is what made us evolve, literally, into who we are today, then how the heck did we have access to the fire before we had the brains to do the clever stick tricks and stuff like that, before we had language and culture to tell our children, hey, check out this trick with the stick we can do? It's a real puzzle, and that's actually one of the, the criticisms of Rangham's work, is there probably wasn't just enough random fire on the landscape, like, hey, it's Africa, let's go over here, hey, there's another fire, let's, uh, let's evolve here for a couple million years, hey, there's another one. <laughs> I've worked around fire. Fire is tricky to keep going. Fire is tricky to, to, to manage. It requires a lot of work. It requires moving fuels around. So, just like going out and trimming branches off with this, that axe tool would be really useful for knocking off branches. If you think back to all the diagrams of our family tree you've seen, we're one last little branch up top, and a dozen, two dozen, maybe different species have been chopped off on this tree, coming along and evolved to us. And in this environment, mostly we're talking about in Africa, there were variables and factors that led to us and selected out many other alternative species. Now, think about that family tree, and think about what you know about evolution. Here's the classic example, Darwin's finches. Darwin's on the beagle, he heads to these islands, and he notices, wow, there's finches on all these islands. 
but they sure look different. Some have big beaks for breaking up seeds, others have little beaks. What's going on? Now, Darwin, not being a geographer, took way too long to take a look at where the finches were from on each island. But the key here is islands. Evolution doesn't happen really great in billions of individuals spread over whole planets. It works really well in isolated pockets, where just a few individuals that might have a particular advantage get to reproduce more, get to change over time, multi-generations. So islands are a big factor in how evolution occurs. And Darwin finally figured that out, and all that's a whole other set of stories. However, in Africa, we had islands. The part of Africa, the cradle of life, the Great Rift Valley is where we think life was going on in a way that somehow led to us. Now, what is a Rift Valley? A Rift Valley is where continental plates are spreading apart, lava is coming up, and unlike the lava flows in Hawaii today, this lava is pouring into internal valleys, miles, tens of miles wide. It has nowhere else to go. It's not going to dump into the ocean. So for thousands, tens of thousands, arguably hundreds of thousands of years in the Great Rift Valley, there were giant lava flows that would have had front edges, warm spots, hot spots, that you could go. Now, some people will always tell me, well, you can't get close to that stuff. Well, no, you can. And we've all been watching Hawaii as people are getting close and enjoying the pleasures of living near lava. Now, these lava flows in our Africa were immense, and there were islands all over the place for millions of years. I've been working with graduate students and undergrads for years, making maps now, trying to get my head around where these lava flows were occurring and when. I've also been having the grad students and undergrads try to figure out where of all of our ancestors were, and we have very little evidence. We have dozens, not hundreds, of digs where we've identified Australopithecine and Artipus and all these different species. I'll let that map sink in a minute. The Great Rift Valley of Africa is where all that lava has been flowing into in huge flows. And hey, look, that's where most of our evolutionary story plays out for millions of years. There's a few other down in South Africa. There's a couple spots over here, but this is where we're talking about. And the students and I have been working to zoom in and look at different eras, particularly this two million year ago point where our brains double in size. What was going on? Where were the lava flows? Now, this is just a beginning element of, re of uh, research at this point. But what we've been finding is pretty exciting stuff. Most of these ancestors of ours were living close, not necessarily right at lava flows, and had exposure to these what I would call islands in the pyrosphere. For tens of thousands, maybe longer years, there would be front edges in these huge lava flows in which a small group could live and get used to eating cooked food, get used to not needing fur, get used to needing two feet and a hand to bring wood maybe back to their campfires that were on the front edges of this lava, creating a situation in which they'd have access to the food to allow their brains to continue to develop to where we are today. Once again, the parts around the Olduvai Gorge, parts up in, in Kenya and Ethiopia, have this remarkable coincidence in space. I'm a geographer. What I think is, why there? What was going on there? And this is what I see going on there. There are some things happening in the same places in the same time that are worth thinking about. And we're going to keep working on this research here in the near future. What I want you to take away from this is this one big idea. We are the fire species. We're the only species on Earth that makes fire. We're the only one I've seen that's good at controlling it. I mean, you can train a dog to run with a burning stick, but I bet you, actually, you probably can't. That's tricky. So we have evolved, but we've also co-evolved with the fire we take to the planet. And in this time when we're thinking about climate change and our effect on the globe and our effect on the, on the landscape, it can be very useful to embrace this idea, we are the fire animal. This is what we bring to the planet. This is what we bring to the climate, is our interests in fire that are millions of years old. It's, and we're committed. We have to wear clothes. We have to have metal. We have to have all these tools. And we are burning the heck out of everything we touch. We bring fire everywhere we go. And I think that can be a useful starting point when you think about problems like climate change, development, deforestation. Remember, you are a fire animal. Thank you. <laughs>